cats, cops, and C4. She could feel her opportunity coming along nicely. The pattern was long and only seemed random. It was certainly not something she could decipher in the middle of battle, but it was clear the manacles around her wrists had a pattern, which to be fair, all things built by any kind of intelligent mind did. These ones just had a very useful pattern that was designed to trip up and disrupt someone. The first part of the pattern was that it never repeated a frequency too quickly. The frequencies would return, but only after a time, only after at minimum five shifts. And there were at least six states of the axiom. These six states were broken into three general frequencies of high, medium, and low. They would also pulse or smooth the axiom to shift it, giving each hand one of six things it could do at any one time. That sort of nonsense could, would, and did shatter any active axiom effect. It was also trivial to make and would not cause any form of long-term damage, which she suspected was her saving grace. The shackles have to keep her alive, but so long as she's alive, she's far from harmless. They also shifted out of sync with each other. One would shift slightly faster than once a second, and the other would take a little longer than a second to shift. This meant she had a rapid shifting of axiom in her at any one moment. Not dangerous to anything, but possibly a gravia, but it would prevent any axiom gathered from being properly held or used, which means she had to make do with the energy in her system and at the specific frequency she was at at that exact moment. Then there is a rattle and all the axiom in the courtroom shifts under the will of the judge. Juliet is a metak, small but fierce. Right now, as a primal Nagasha levitates up the two most damning and disturbing pieces of evidence against her, she's never felt smaller and less fierce. Then that small part of her, that little voice deep within, that only understands the words, no, don't, and stop in a vocabulary sense, screams in defiance. Bazalash is outright glowing as she glares at the two mind slayers, and she has the room's complete and total attention. She's muttering dire invocations in her first language at the sight of the things with a clear twitch in her eye. There will never be a bigger distraction short of a full-on apocalypse. The rattle shakes again, the axiom shifts, the room stares, the judge swears. The left manacle shifts, the right follows, the left shifts again. Juliet shifts from wherever the hell this court is to the very bottom of a spire. From out of a kutha totem embedded in the ceiling to the next level up, she falls and flaps her wings furiously in the filthy, grimy air to angle her fall and catch the edge of a roof. She already needs a bath and is far from finished if she wants to escape. She needs out of the manacles, new clothing, a new face, a new axiom signature and to chemically scramble her own DNA to make a getaway. Tall order, first step to the first part is supplies. Hopefully no one has found the stash and claimed it. Otherwise she's going to have to kill someone and that leaves behind bodies. The immediate reaction to Comet vanishing was an uproar. Her lawyers had backed the hell away from the space she previously had occupied and the weapons of the guards were drawn. The crowd was talking until a bellowing roar from the bailiff quiets them. Judge Bazalash is literally glowing with power crackling across her. There are none of the subconscious movements a person makes. She doesn't even seem to be breathing. The mind slayers in their resin-filled jars are lowered back to containment and sealed. She takes an enormous breath, and at her look alone, the guards lower their weapons. We will be having a short recess as we retrieve our errant defendant. Remain near the court. She orders before slithering over the podium and sliding towards where Comet had vanished. She spares a moment to look at the defense. You are not on trial. This will not reflect poorly upon you, merely your client. Thank you, Your Honor. Arthur stammers out with his eyes the widest they've ever been. Bazalash nods and her lowest arms reach out to grab the space where Juliet had been. The axiom swells and rumbles like an avalanche before a massive tear in the world opens under her grip. She then stretches it upwards as well with her topmost arms to form a gateway. A gateway she shifts through in a flawlessly quick slither that carries her enormous self through in seemingly a single movement. The gateway collapses in upon itself and the courtroom is left in silence. For all of one second, as Chenk rises out of his witness seat and moves to sit beside the now clearly afraid Miss Frost. Throwing off the manacles and wiping the blood off her hands, Juliet breathes a sigh of relief. She'll need to find another hobo to get the clothing. This one was a bleeder. But that's what you get when you steal from her. 
a sharp chunk of concrete right in the chest, that the woman was in Agasha had made it feel good. It was about as close as she would ever get to stabbing the judge, and the axiom roars and she starts moving. No time to think, time to move, time to move fast. She doesn't teleport or fly. Metak flight and any kind of teleportation will be exactly what they're... The sound of a Nagasha rattle echoes around the level and carries so much power with it that if anything else tried to bring the same amount to bear, they'd cause a null cascade. Oh. Oh, shit. The Tritite lady is after her personally. Panic attack later. Run now. She leaves the area her stash used to be at a dead sprint and slips through the crumbling, decayed building. Tiptoes around a woman that seems to be deep in some drug-fueled trance, grabs a discarded coat and drapes it over herself and keeps moving. She needs to keep moving. She can sense the axiom shift again, this time feeling like a maelstrom has opened up in the ocean and is pulling everything towards itself. But the pattern, it's familiar, like a healing there is a wail of panic and despair behind her. No, she couldn't have. She's a judge, a punisher, not a healer. She's not her son. Bazalash says nothing as a now formerly filthy and almost entirely dead woman wails in relief and despair. The healing had also scoured off all the grime and filth that had afflicted the woman, but she was still clearly unwell in infection, infestation, further addictions, None of those would be cleared away by the quick flesh knitting she had done to heal the girl. She berates herself internally for letting the criminal get even this far. Unfortunately, there were no ways to restrict someone that were flawless, not without breaking laws left and right. And her duty is to uphold them, not break them. At the edge of her senses, she can distinctly feel someone trying to blend their axiom presence with the background. They're doing a fine job of it, but even a perfect job wouldn't be enough. The axiom is a distraction. She used sound waves and heat to track the little criminal. Everyone relies so much on axiom, they forget that Nagasha are snakes. They have thermal pits. They can sense heat. They have ear holes. They can hear. Honestly, people get so caught up in the extravagance of things, they lose focus on the base truths. Also, the little idiot left a trail in the filth. There was clearly someone the size of a Metak in the room recently and it showed exactly which way she was going. It's all right, little one. My carelessness got you hurt. So you are my responsibility now, Bazalash states before holding out her top left hand, and there's a sense of axiom crashing down. Her hand tightens over the neck of Juliet Comet, who is now there and slowly being brought to face the furious gaze of Judge Bazalash. The rattling of her tail wasn't just to announce her presence, it was to put the local axiom in her control. And now it was. Congratulations, you have exhausted the entirety of my mercy. Even Jaltraki's mother failed to do so, and I had her executed for her many, many crimes. Well done, she says in a voice that sounds amused, but it's laying on a bedrock of controlled fury that calls to mind images of a smoking volcano. The rattle shakes and the axiom twists seemingly of its own volition to obey. She slithers back into the courtroom. Retrieve a stasis pod. Miss Comet has proven herself unable to respect this court and will be tried in absentia. She is too dangerous and skilled to be trusted with reasonable restrictions to her movements and abilities, and as such must be held securely regardless of its effects upon her capacity to stand trial. At once, Bailiff Maprico states, pulling out a communicator, and quickly barking orders into it, even as Spike and Forsyth type things out at a rapid pace. Your Honor, the pod is on its way. What about the... Maprico takes a moment to reevaluate the filthy Nagasha that Judge Bazalosh had returned with. Woman you have brought back with you. She was attacked and nearly killed by Comet. Comet escaped my court and attacked her. My court. My fault. This woman is now under my protection until such a time she can support and protect herself. I see. May I recommend a recess for today? Yes, that would be wisest. Everything needs to settle so we do not make rash judgments after what has happened here today. Bazalash agrees. Court will resume at 8.45 tomorrow morning. Well, that was more or less what I expected, Chank says, and Amy looks at him oddly. Comet is being forced into a stasis pod by the judge and the enormous woman activates it before slipping her hand out of the stasis field without releasing the prisoner. An interesting skill. 
something to throw at the nerd squad and see what shakes out. They've been going all over the place with temporal nonsense and would love to take a look at it. What do you mean? With all the pressure on her, Comet was going to try something. Either courtroom shenanigans or an escape attempt. Specialist Barnabas, are you implying that you knew that Miss Comet would attempt an escape? Judge Basilash asks, and he looks right at her. I knew that in her position, I would try something, anything, to get out from under the mountain of evidence and testimonies that was about to crush her into a fine paste. With her numerous crimes, she was staring down a death sentence before she tried to escape. There is no legal punishment you can give her that will surpass that. So with nothing to lose and everything to gain, an attempt to escape or have the entire trial thrown out due to courtroom nonsense, he shrugs. It looked inevitable, but there was no way to completely stop it without committing all sorts of crimes. We can't just constantly null her. That's illegal. Containing her in a tritite coffin? Illegal unless she's a clear and present danger, and she hadn't directly hurt anyone yet. The scrambling manacles were only on her because they caused no direct harm. Torture is illegal, so of course containment measures that cause pain and suffering are also illegal as they count as torture. Yes, that's the trouble with law at times. Obeying it can make enforcing it most difficult, and special privileges can only go so far. This trial will have to be substantially more exhaustive now. Trying someone in absentia is a delicate and difficult thing to do properly or appropriately. It is an enormously controversial power entrusted in me, one that if abused even once will be forever tainted. You really take this seriously, don't you? Chunk asks as he raises an eyebrow while trying to better understand where all this sternness comes from. The first memory that is truly my own, the first thing I understood about myself, was the sheer devastation I had caused when I was attacked. It is the central foundation of everything I know that I am too powerful for the rest of the galaxy, that my every action and reaction, even if I choose to do nothing, will have enormous consequences for everyone and everything else. So I must be equal to that power. And so I am. The standard I hold my court to, I hold myself to as well. Basilosh says, and now both of Cheng's eyebrows are up. Well, color me impressed then, your honor. 